Hi everyone, a very warm welcome to our fifth consecutive session on digitization of MSME finance, facilitated by BFC from Zurich on Thursday every second week over this summer. In the past four sessions, we discussed first, how to make digital transformation an integral part of the corporate strategy. Second, how to make the digitization of financial services work. Third, how to motivate and enable our staff to drive digital transformation forward. Fourth, in our previous session two weeks ago, we looked at the key success factors for partnerships as an enabler and accelerator of digital transformation. And today, in our fifth and conclusive session, we will talk about what some call the lifeblood of digital transformation, data management. My name is Michael Kortenbusch. I'm moderating this session for you today from Zurich. In my normal life, I'm a consultant in MSME and agricultural finance and the managing director of business and finance consulting, in short, BFC. Imagine you are on a vacation, enjoying the blue sky, the clear water while relaxing on a beach when your child is approaching you with this question, Daddy, how many sand grains are there at all beaches of the world? You have gone out without your smartphone, but as you were attending this Ask BFC webinar session on data management, you remember the answer, of course. One zettabyte. Your answer is with no hesitation. One zeta what? Yes, one zettabyte. That is a number with just 21 zeros, not more or less than that. And what or has this all to do with data management? Well, in 2020, there were 44 zettabytes of data worldwide. So we have already 44 times more data volume on the world then we have to do sand grains on the beaches. Wow! And it keeps growing fast. In 2025, as the estimate goes, we will see one zettabyte of new data being generated each 48 hours. Little surprise that we have so much talk about big data today. But what does big data actually stand for? First, it's volume. It's definitely very big, as we just have seen. Second, it's the speed at which data are moving around or velocity. Just think of hundreds of millions of emails, text messages, data transfers that happen every day, mostly in real-time mode. And third, data appear in different forms. Some are structured data, like a balance sheet. A lot of data comes to us today unstructured for example, like a photo or a Google search result. We speak here of the variety of data. And the fourth V word in this row is veracity, which stands for the credibility of data. Not all digital data sets can be trusted and we need to apply methods to validate and clean data to be able to use them. These four Vs make the proper handling of data complex task but much worse to go for that task, looking at the benefits from transitioning to a digitized data management. So let me introduce to you our three panelists now we have today, all experienced finance and technology practitioners who are connected. So I start with Denise Moniot, is a co-finder of Rubix, a global consulting team in AI and product design for mobile financial services. Before, he was a CIO at MicroCred, which is today called Baobab, and where he was in charge of innovation and technology strategy. Denise, thank you for being with us today and connected from Milan. Hi, Michael. Hello, everybody. Happy to be there. Good. Avitis Ovakimian, IT manager at Inico Bank, which is a leading South Caucasian bank where he manages multiple engineering teams. His eight year of experience in project management, data analysis, risk management and financial analysis also includes working for globally active financial organizations. Avitis, thanks for joining us from Yerevan. Hi everyone, thank you for uh, inviting me. 
Great. Last but not least, Denis Zikeyev. He's a CTO, CRO, and co-founder at Risk Tools, a risk assessment service operating in the Ukraine. Denise has a demonstrated track record of working in the computer software industry, including founding a number of companies as a CTO over the last 11 years. And his skill set lies not only in risk management, big data analytics, machine learning, and data science. There's one additional feature which I really was very intrigued to hear about. Denise also practices and offers training in meditation techniques. So I'm interested to know, Denise, how that is connected or can be connected with good data management. Denise, thanks for being with us and connected Hi. from Kiev. Hi, everyone. All right, so we have introduced ourselves and now it's our good tradition that we kick off this uh, meeting again with a poll to our global audience uh, to measure the temperature, as we say. So what is your current status for digitizing data? So uh, to be clear, what I mean with digitizing data is uh, this stands for the transfer of data from a physical form into a paper, from paper into digital form, right? And uh, from the subsequent storage, processing and analyzing. And while you're completing the poll, uh, let me briefly explain how you can reach us and also what is our agenda today. So for those who are first time here in this Ask BFC session, there are three ways how you can reach us. During the session, you can write in the Q&A window at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And before and after the session, we are always happy to receive your emails directly in, uh, as an email or through the Ask BFC website. And if it all goes well today, we will have more questions than we can offer you answers with just because our time limit is only 60 minutes for this session. So we will post answers on your questions we do not manage to process on our website a few days after the session. So with this, can we close the poll, please? And can we share, please? Great. So the majority says we have just started our digitization of data journey and we are making progress. So we are pretty much in the middle I think that's also what myself and the speakers, my panelists have anticipated. So great to have you all here. And with this, I think we can already move on. Before we go to block one, let me introduce the agenda. So three main blocks, always we have three blocks. The first one, how to structure the digitization of data in a financial organization. We will hear uh, mini case studies for each of them. So the first one will be covered by Avetis. And then we have managing data quality. And we have from data analytics to business insights covered by both Denise. With this, I hand it over Avitis to you uh, for the first block to set the stage. And before we do so, I think we have another poll, right? So can we have that poll also coming up? What are the key challenges the organization experiences in transitioning to digitized data management? So Avitis wants to know what are your key challenges. And while you fill this up, I think we can uh, already start with your presentation and we will return in between to the results, Avitis. So if you want to take the floor and uh, give us your okay. insights on the topic, how to build data infrastructure efficiently. Avitis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So we can start from the very first slide, please. Yeah. Um, so, all the, the digitization should be treated as a project. And as any project, we need to start from the requirement collection. And for that purposes, uh, our case was that we have divided it into three main domains in order to be uh, available to collect the requirements correctly. So the first one was the sales, where we collected the data like lead, application, contract, and so on, that is uh, peculiar to the sales part. And then we went to the finance. Uh, the finance was uh, the most important for the reporting purposes in terms of the managerial reporting, uh, financial planning and analysis uh, department that are using all the time all this report. Uh, so based on this data, we are able to construct balance sheets, PNL, payment data to analyze and model the, uh, the budgets or anything that is modeled in the financial uh, market. And then, of course, the risk, 
where we collect the underlying information that is coming from the sales, applications, uh, credit history checks, salary checks, uh, rejections, the reasons behind these rejections, and of course the uh, corresponding indicators of the portfolio quality, portfolio at risk, uh, debt collection data, and so on and so forth. So uh, this was the main domains that we have divided, and then we are starting the BA phase. We business analysis phase. So we collected all the reports and the reporting tools that are currently are being used in the in the bank and we try to merge and construct a new data tables that will be sufficient for to cover the current needs of the business and of course to anticipate the future needs of the uh, coming from the stakeholders. Um, and of course based on the uh, using the oldest report we define the refresh logics and the updates of the data that should be done. This is for the first part that we need to understand when we're starting the business, I mean the project. And after collecting the, after collecting the requirement, we need to analyze the current state in IT. Uh, and in this case, we need to answer the following question. How the data is stored? So if it is stored, uh, the, uh, dispersed, in our case, it was dispersed in multiple different databases with a lot of noise coming from the duplicate data provider errors. And so very, very bad things that are coming when, they, when you have a lot of data. And uh, of course, uh, there are some issues when we, when we need to parse all this data correctly into uh, tables, when you have credit history checks, for instance, stored in an XML format. This was the, for the first two questions. And then we need to understand what kind of human resources we possess. In our case, we had one business analyst, two DB developers, and of course, one business intelligence analyst that made it uh, the data analytics available for the uh, for for the business, and then available infrastructure. When we need to please, when let's go to the next slide. When we need to understand what kind of infrastructure we are going to use. So let's discuss all these uh, possibilities. So when we are, when we are talking about a bank, it might be. Uh, thought as an overcomplicated solution when we have a separate DB with a data warehouse. Uh, but nevertheless, for a small companies, you can use uh, one, one source, single source production DB with small ETL processes that does all the job during the night and fetching all the data from very beginning of the, of the history of the company. So it's all about the company size and what you need to uh, get every, every day on, on your screen. Of course, then we have the second uh, question. Is it on-premise, is it cloud, or is it a mix? It depends on the regulation. In Armenia, we are uh, limited to on-premise solutions. Nevertheless, the cloud solutions are cheaper. You are always serviced by the uh, platform that is provided by the uh, pro platform provider. And uh, you always get the updates, and it's, and it's much easier to operate with it. And the second, and the third question is what data analytics tools you need to, to have. In our case, we have used SAP business objects and the SAP business objects were the cheapest one in the on-premise solutions. But in this case, we have the uh, problem of lack of professionals that can work with the SAP business object. In the case when you are not limited to on-premise solutions, you can have cloud solution like Power BI, which any Excel proficient uh, user can shift to Power BI and uh, provide the uh, analytics that you need. So it's all about the way that you can work with the with your data. So this is kind of uh, my representation of how we can structure and how we can start the process of the digitization in the company. And also on, on the right side of my slide, I depicted the way that it should be done in a in big in big companies with multiple data sources, CRM, uh, AB, uh, automatic banking system that you have collecting in a warehouses and then making it available for the users. Thank you very much, Avitis. Um, let's um, look at the results of the poll, of our poll two, and um, uh, if we can share them, I think they are being shared now. So if we take a look here at this, uh, mm -hmm. we see that uh, more than half of the respondents think that inappropriate technical tools are key challenges um, uh, in transitioning to digital data management. And then we see uh, things like 
uh, lack of internal resources overall strategy. I mean, you have seen in your past work experience uh, different institutions dealing with this. And I'm sure you are, you are communicating in the community uh, of professionals uh, also in your market, basically. So how, what does this result tell you? Is it expected, unexpected, anything surprising here? It is expected because in this case, when we're, when we're talking about digitization, it needs uh, software developers. So in, in our case, we need the DB developers. And it's not very common currently in the market to, to have these professionals on board, especially in the financial market. I mean, uh, it's quite hard to hire a person in a bank, really. Uh, I'm cur currently struggling in uh, hiring a person from IT company to, to come to, uh, to a bank. Nevertheless, it's also a problem of the IT management of the, of the bank or uh, MFI that we have a lot of uh, solutions available in the market and it's quite hard to, 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 to choose one. That is why in my uh, presentation I showed that it all depends on what you can have. In our case, we were limited to an on-premise solutions and we had to go with this uh, sub-business object. But in other company that I worked, we were working on a Power BI and the tool was like nothing more than Excel. And uh, with, uh, with the, DB, the database admin, we made it to, uh, to the end, the project. So it all depends on what you have in terms of the limitation in terms of software. And then it comes on the end, you need to answer what you need from your, uh, from your project. So, and you can choose the data analytics tool and the tools for the, uh, for the digital digitization. Thank you very much, Avitis. Uh, I think we can straight away move to one question from the audience, uh, from Jacinta uh, Kamemba. Uh, it's asking, what does, uh, what does you, what do you mean by DB and uh, uh, DWH on uh, this slide? Uh, I think that's in the first bullet point. Um, if you just can. Uh, yeah, DB on. is a database. The mm -hmm. DWH is data warehouse. Data warehouse and uh, Database. database exactly exactly okay great um well um uh, moving back i think we have another question here from milan vimic mm -hmm. uh, when you work with various data and information sets reports email online and research how do you efficiently in terms of available time and resource recognize what is meaningful and useful so how do you cut through the noise probably is the question here so what's your answer there uh, the answer is the following. So you need to understand the business, of course. Uh, so you cannot jump from one uh, market. I mean, from I, uh, I don't know, gambling to finance, understand what is useful. So in this case, you need to understand the business and out of that, you're, you'll be able to, uh, to, make, uh, to make the data speak. So based on it, you're covering, you need to clean the noise, but it's, it's the only possibility when you understand the business. Yeah, um, I just write this down. I like the quote. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So um, very good. I mean, I'm getting. If, I, if I may, if I oh, may jump please. in right here, I think uh, um, the, the question is also to ask the right question. Ask the question first. Uh, what is important or not depends on which question you're trying to answer with the data. Huh? And then indeed cut the noise of all these things that are not talking about your question. But first, I see a lot of cases where the question is not asked. Let's do something with data. But what question are we asking data to answer for us? Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Denise, for that um, addition. I, I agree with Denise, but sometimes when you are just jump, uh, messing around with the data, you sometimes get cool insight that you have never thought. So this is the, this is the, the coolest part when you are working with a big data. So you are saying you're getting questions basically um, you you wouldn't get um, before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, would would you? I mean, that's a question maybe to all of you um, here in the call. Uh, would you think this um, data management, digital data management, uh, as we see, is a capacity problem? And uh, to know how it works, it opens up new opportunities for professionals, for young professionals, for students, because there's a gap in the market. Basically, I mean, uh, there's a new uh, professions are emerging like data scientists and so on. Um, what can you say about this? What is your advice to young people who like to work with numbers? I mean, go and become a data scientist now or what would you say, Avitis? Uh, so 
you cannot, uh, in my personal opinion, you cannot become a data scientist right away. So I have differentiation in the data scientist in, in, in two, two ways. The first data scientist that can work clean and prepare the data and another type of data scientist that like to work only with clean data. So as a proposal to a student, start working on messy data, clean it, prepare it, and then become a data scientist and get the, the, get the insight. So this is the most valuable data scientist that I am currently trying to hire. When I see a data scientist that cannot work with the data and requires clean data with clean inst instructions, this is not a good uh, way to start as a professional. You need to work with it. You need to be professional in SQL. You need to understand it's not only running the model. You need to be able to work with the data. This, this is the type of the person that I'm currently trying to hire. Okay, good luck with that recruitment. Um, <laughs> I imagine it's a challenge, but uh, I'm also sure you will find one. Um, uh, what, um, we have another question here uh, also, I think from um, Jankinta Kamemba again, I think. Uh, how do you handle the challenge of data not being clean, especially for institutions that were not digitized at the beginning? Uh, this is a challenge, especially in financial institutions in Africa. Uh, a quick answer from you before we move on. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, it, it, it all the better at, in, in which, what, 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 what means in this case in not clean? Is it stored in PDF or it is stored in, for instance, in XML? This is the hardest part. Uh, in, in this case, in the bank, we started, we understood that we cannot, uh, we, we need to have the data from three or four years before, uh, I, mean, I mean, the periodicity should be three, four years ago, starting from 2016 or 15, I'm not, I cannot recall it currently now, but it all depends what it means, it's not clean. If it's stored in PDF, it's quite a cumbersome information to be, uh, to be digitized. If it is stored in XML, you need to understand with the business analyst, what kind of information you need to parse and store. So it all depends, of course, on the, uh, as Denise mentioned, what kind of question you need to answer. Good, yeah, that makes, that makes good sense. Uh, we are squeezed by time. Um, so I'm afraid, uh, as for all the other panelists as well, we just have to move on. Um, so Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Avitis, for the interesting presentation and uh, uh, a reminder to everyone in the audience, if you would like to uh, continue the conversation um, after the webinar today, uh, also bilateral with the experts, you will find them on LinkedIn and um, uh, we can say they would be happy if you, if you send them a message basically and they can continue talking to them. But you can always write to BFC and we will also pick up your questions. And again, about the questions, in the Zoom window, uh, we see there's already active use of that. So in the bottom of the Zoom window, please put in your questions. Um, so let's move on uh, now. And uh, I'd like to invite our second speaker uh, now to speak about uh, the theme two, which is managing data quality, uh, which is uh, done by Denise Zikiev. But before Denise is, uh, Kicking off, we have another poll, which I'd like to, um, to be asked coming up. And the poll is here now open. What have you found and do you believe to be the main challenges in managing data quality? So what are your main challenges? And the same to save time, I think uh, Denise, uh, I hand it over to you and uh, we are listening uh, with impatience to your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. So let's get started and let's talk about uh, data quality management. Um, and maybe this session uh, will answer, uh, will, give, will give answers to some questions mentioned before. So the question is very important since uh, the evolution of business begins with new information, new dependencies and new insights. And uh, I call this process data driven business evolution. Uh, this, co uh, this concept is most applicable in the uh, financial sector. Uh, in order to understand the essence of the problem, uh, let's look, uh, look at it from the point of view of the problem of signal and noise. Uh, the raw data generated by our business processes contains uh, both relevant information and noise. Uh, you can see it on the left side of the picture. 
Noise is the data that we cannot yet interpret. It gives us zero understanding about business. And uh, a signal is data that drives the evolution of our business. The space of noise is the resource where we, you get new signals. The task of data quality management is to create a methodology and technical base for a continuous process of searching for a signal in the entire volume of initial data. So from left side to right side. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now I'd like to outline the key points of building successful infra infrastructure that will allow you to build a continuous process of searching for relevant information in the raw data stream. Uh, the first point, store raw data in dedicated storage. And uh, you can use technology that is easier for your IT team to implement. It doesn't matter uh, which technology you choose for this. The main thing uh, is that it allows you to save all, all the data uh, that is generated by your business process. It's important because the data quality management is iterative process. So you should be able to return to the space of noise and uh, find new portions of uh, signals. Next, uh, next point, index as much uh, known keys as possible, such as client IDs, agreement numbers, and uh, etc. It means that you should be able to search and retrieve all data associated with, with given uh, client or any logical entity uh, that plays a key role in uh, business, business process. Next step, build a distributed transformation framework. Uh, you should be able to transform the raw data into well-structured uh, data for further analysis. Since uh, the amount of raw data is huge uh, and it requires uh, high com uh, computational uh, resources, you should, uh, you should use distributed data processing technology. It will allow you to transform noise into potential signals in parallel. Next, uh, when you have uh, structured data, you can use BI tools and machine learning uh, to get uh, certain insights from data. And then you implement these insights uh, in existing business process. And uh, all this process is iterative. That is, uh, you are continuously transforming uh, the raw data, creating new data structures, and uh, continuously, uh, that is continuously being uh, analyzed. The circles is uh, endless, and it means that your data-driven driven evolution will never end. Next slide, please. Uh, on this slide, I'll br uh, briefly uh, show you example of our uh, technology uh, that we use to build our risk models. On the top of the figure, you see the root data storage, uh, data generated by business processes, as well as data received from third parties uh, are sent to it. In our case, uh, the business process is a loan origination process. It, purpose, uh, it produces a loan application which uh, contains about five or six fields, like uh, social number, phone, etc. And for each application, we obtain various third party data, which includes credit history and data received from local data providers. The quality of this data varies depending on uh, data provider. All this data in B is being stored in our raw data storage. We never know uh, what segments of raw data uh, will be used, uh, we will use in future. Uh, that's why we store everything in our cluster. It's important. In the middle part of the figure, you can see our distributed transformation system, which produce, uh, produces structured data and stores it, it in SQL format for further use by business analysis and machine learning tools. Uh, and all this data management framework is connected to uh, the core IT platform through API. Uh, this is how our, our risk models are implemented in law and regeneration platforms. And in conclusion, uh, I'd like to say that the most important thing is uh, methodology of working with uh, data and the choice of specific technology is uh, very secondary. That's it, thanks. Thanks a lot, Denise. Um, that's uh, a good good conclusion, and uh, probably I got I got the 
how to say, um, intuition, um, a connection between uh, your meditation and the noise. So uh, you yes. do meditation also when you have a lot of noise around you, you want just to calm down. Uh, and uh, you choose the noise uh, topic basically also as the theme of your presentation. So maybe uh, th there's a small connection with that. Um, yes, meditation uh, <laughs> allows you to be comfortable with uncertainty and noise. Yeah, That's exactly, right. exactly, great. Um, let's move to the poll. Uh, so um, uh, thank you to the audience for completing the poll. And uh, if you look at the results here, I think um, we see a little bit the, uh, um, uh, the previous poll also showed that there was a lack of capacity. And here we say not enough experts is a challenge um, to complete successful data quality management. But then already also a lack of organization structure and systems. So kind of integrating this um, data management into the whole organization. Uh, any comments from your side on these outcomes? Uh, yes, I think uh, that um, not enough uh, experts to complete. Uh, uh, there is not enough uh, experts that understand in business. This is the problem, I think. Not experts in data science or some other technologies. Uh, you, we should connect knowledge in technologies and business knowledge. And this is a key for, for successful data, data management. So then, then I have a second question. Let's assume um, uh, I'm understanding business. I'm already working in a bank and I think, what's my next career step now? So I'm, let's say, in the credit department somewhere. I understand the business, yeah? And um, how can I transition from there to data? I guess I have to do some studies in addition or what's the typical career path then? I mean, how can I move on? Mm, uh, study, uh, study simple techniques of data management. Uh, the simple simple things are better than uh, complex things mm -hmm. and uh, you can start from uh, from something simple simple algorithms simple uh, simple technologies uh, and then uh, you can grow uh, in technologies uh, depending on your requirements so do, do, don't uh, focus on something simple that you can implement uh, in uh, in time michael can i add sure terms? Yes, this. please. Like, really, currently, in any international financial companies, even risk managers, financial analysts need to know SQL. Co colleagues, currently, Excel is, is needed, but you need also the SQL as well. So learn SQL. This will much help, uh, make it much easier to work with the data, to analyze the data, and make your everyday job like you can make it in minutes when you did it like a couple of hours before. Learn SQL, this is really crucial in current market and in, especially in financial uh, markets. The high-end high companies really just require uh, SQL knowledge like English. So you need to know SQL. 100% agree with Avetis. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, just on the top of my head, do you have any tip to managers? I mean, uh, to stay in the loop because uh, the, on the senior management uh, level probably will not all be able to learn SQL when they don't uh, have it yet. Uh, so um, uh, how, much, how much are they actually needed? Or is this more a technical thing? I mean, I also find that senior managers maybe not need to be the IT experts to run an organization. It's a different skill set. But what, what do you expect as data experts, basically, um, being functions from senior management to be ready for this? Uh, you need to ask correct questions for your, uh, from your data, the data manager. So you need to ask correct questions. You need to have correct expectations. And uh, of course, you need to define <laughs> the correct KPIs that need to be analyzed. So, and then we can make like all this data available for you. And you need to understand how to read this data. In, in the top management, you need to understand how to read the data and how to treat the data. Okay, so I would like to ask the others also. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Denise cannot repeat now. You need to ask questions. You said that already once, and you also said it, Denise Moniot. So, we have it already in our brain. Denise, anything to add, Moniot? Uh -huh. um, uh, one thing, I, I haven't, and I'm not able to write any, a single line of SQL. Um, uh, or any other programming language. Now you can go and look at my track record in digitalizing finance and build uh, 
credit scoring and that sort of things and then you can compare and you know what i think about the the comment though i understand the logic and i i very well do think it's an interesting comment from avetis but um yeah i don't know how to write a scan i've never done that yeah and it still doesn't uh, hamper you to uh, to go on uh with what you do i yeah. i have around me people who are excellent at that yes yeah. Yeah. but i think the trick is not um yeah everybody everybody has to have its own role in the company you know and uh, um, I think um, um, I know what you can execute with um, data science and the technology around that uh, I don't need to execute it myself yeah I mean what I'm getting from all of you is um, you kind of need to have the big picture you always say you have to start from the problem from the challenge to ask the right questions uh, you have to know the business uh, this is not a really technical task, uh, but you have to have the big picture and understand why it's needed and uh, how it could work. Yeah, but uh, before, we, before we write a single line of code in a project, we usually have a, a, a methodological approach to understand the data. You don't need to write code for that. You, we look at the data point. We say, okay, if the data point is how many SMS the, the client has sent uh, or how, how much he has on, how much money has sent through B2P transfer the last week. Okay, you can, without writing any code, think about what does it tell you about the customer. And that, that is what, um, for me, this is about. It's not so much about queries and, and tra data transformation. I mean, this is very important. And when it's done, what's become critical is to think about what does this data tell me about something without being fooled by um, too much um, technology details. Right, right. All right. Um, let me move to two or more questions we got from the audience. One is from Sanjeev Goel. With the availability of so many IT solution providers in the market, how do you choose the best option in terms of digitization, cloud services and business support? So I think it's again, how to deal with complexity um maybe um denise the key if you can have the first shot and then if i this and denise monyot have some, something to add denise what your your recommendation as a cto uh i think it, it it it's not very important uh you can choose what the most easier and understandable for you uh that's it uh don't don't, don't uh, try to select uh, from the first time the best the best solution get the easiest try it, uh, make some experiments, and then uh, you can choose something uh, more complex and maybe more expensive. The best is the enemy of the good, huh? Or how was the saying? I think something like that, yeah? So the best yes. is the enemy of the good, yeah? I think. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, my comment would be, it depends on what kind of professionals you have. So you need, and what, what kind of professional you can have. So it depends on the availability of the human resources as well. So if you choose the best, the best of the best, but you don't have a person that can operate with it. You, so I'm, I'm always talking about the bad side of my job that I need to hire so much people for, 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 for that purposes. That's why it also depends on what kind of uh, professionals you have. There is no uh, panacea for everything. There is no one one tool that rules. There is no one ring that rules them all. So <laughs> you need to choose based on what, what situation. Yeah. All right, Avi. Yeah. Thank you, Denis Moniot. What do you say? Yeah, no, I agree. I concur. I, I think uh, the, the, a tool does not get the job, job done for you. You need to get the job done and then get the tool for that. And maybe some tools will make it a bit harder for you, some a bit more simple, but it's not the point. Um, I think uh, sometimes we, I've been um, discussing with people looking for a scorecard solution and they had not thought about the scorecard they would put inside it, just the scorecard solution. A scorecard solution is, a, is, an, empty, is an empty shell. You have nothing from it unless you you can build in, in poor scorecard solution, you can build excellent, very efficient scorecards and in excellent, most advanced scorecard solutions, you can build the worst scorecard ever. So yeah, again, this is, this is just a tool. It's just a tool. Don't be afraid for, um, uh, for this choice. I mean, uh, but to have decision fatigue, if, uh, there are so many choices. Uh, I think that's a problem uh, that exists in all, in all kinds of sectors. Um, 
thank you. We have another question from Frederick Dahan from the EBRD. Could you please touch on personal data protection? Um, so uh, again, um, yeah, who wants to take that? I would say maybe Denise Moniot, you start with this. Uh, I'm sure you are in the EU based, uh, you have uh, had to do with that. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, so um, it's, it's a very complex topic. We could speak for much more time than we have about that. Um, Certainly, I think that it's, it, it really depends on, on which data you, you use. And I think uh, overall, what I could say is that I will come back on that later. But um, if, you, um, if you go for a, an intensive use of a limited amount of data, uh, you can figure out a lot of ways of doing a lot of interesting things without using too much data and therefore without using enough data to unravel the identity and jeopardize uh, the identity and the privacy of the of the of the users of the client that you are uh, analyzing data from so um, you don't need probably in financial services to use all these data that will unravel the privacy uh, you can do a lot of things with much less data and uh, yeah in particular, you can keep only anonymized data and you can use uh, consolidated data um, and all these techniques will actually prevent you from, um, from really unraveling the privacy. Um, many okay. more things to say, but I think that's something that um, struck my mind uh, initially. Thank you, Denise. I mean, uh, in the EU, we have the law. I mean, there's data protection law, a very complex one and I think which has got global recognition. But um, uh, the question for me is in places like, um, uh, for example, the Caucasus uh, here, Armenia uh, or Ukraine, uh, Avitis, Denise, uh, I mean, what is your view on this in terms of a regulation? Uh, so, I mean, the local regulation, how they look at this topic and B, uh, you're all connected with international uh, funders also. Uh, like, um, I mean, development banks, and they want to know also what you do, and they want to make sure you comply with certain standards. So um, what is this um, about in, in your countries? If you can give a short answer on a very complex question, please. Yeah, in our case, as I've mentioned, so we have a limitation, I would say, from regulator that we are keeping all the data in Armenia and on-premises. So we are not, but we are somehow limited in terms of using the cloud solutions and we cannot store all our, all our client data um, outside of the Armenia. So, but anyways, if for instance, Amazon uh, opens its data, its data centers in Armenia, we're allowed to use it, so there is no problem. So currently we have a problem in terms of uh, keeping the data outside of the Armenia. So this is the, basically the only limitation in terms of the data management. Uh, and of course, we have a regulation in terms of the banking bank secret, if, if I translate it correctly. So we cannot uh, make make it possible, make it available for anyone outside the bank. So this is the, the way that we have the personal information for data protection. Thank you, Avitis. Um, that's pretty clear. Denise, be careful. Uh uh, yes, in Ukraine, we don't have uh, too much regulations about data, excluding some uh, some sp special cases like banks or credit bureaus uh, where uh, they have to store all uh, data in uh, local local clusters. So uh, in our, uh, our way is uh, business is first and regulations is just a frame uh, to adjust. So we don't have uh, much problems and stoppers like regulations. We, we use clusters, we use cloud solutions, and some data, data we should store in our cluster. That's it. So some people in the business community, uh, based on that answer, could say you are lucky, and um, others in the development community might be frightened and saying, uh, but what's happening with consumer protection? Uh, so I think we can conclude that this is a, um, to the question of Frederick Dahan, um, a moving target. And um, I think it's getting also uh, every day changing because uh, there are more data, there are new sources, uh, new ways, a lot of things are not set yet. And probably that means also that a lot uh, of questions have to be asked to the uh, internal um, value set of an organization. And um, 
uh, their own uh, self-regulating uh, efforts uh, here until regulation has been catching up with everything. Okay, complex topic. We probably could have a separate session only on that, but we don't have time for that now. So um, let's move on to case study three. Again, started by a poll, short poll. So session three is um, um, covered by Denis Moniot, and the poll is open now. Do you think you have the right enough data internally to automate your create decision making? Well, that's a very short question, only yes and no. Uh, so, um, but uh, from data analytics to business insights, uh, let's people answer, and uh, I hand it over to you, Denis. All right, thank you very much. I'm just watching, curious of the result. I'm watching the competition between the no and the yes, and that's uh, quite interesting to see. It's quite um, a competition already, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a competition. You'd see one trying to win. And All right, um, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so yeah, we're trying to, to talk now a little bit about what exactly, and coming back to some of my comments also about what exactly, um, we can do with data so that's around the comment like you have to uh, ask the right question and asking the right question is very important so um, I I will try to cover three uh, this general topic from analytics to business insight the first one uh, will be um, what can we do with data the second one is the one from the poll. Do we have enough data in financial services? And the third one I'm going to try to cover if you have enough time is um, what are the techniques, what are the methodologies used um, to do that? Okay, so let's move to the first one. If the slides want to move with me, so let's go. What should we do with our data? So um, we can move to the next slide. And here we understand that data, it's all about making decisions, basically. We're not going to go around it so much. It's really about making decisions. And I'm trying here to split it in two, the macro decisions and the micro decisions. So the macro decisions are those big, very important, impactful decisions that we want to, that we have to make. Um, and that will be global for the company or big decisions. They are not at the very tiny level of our customers. So these are things that we make using data for a long time. It's actually not new. We've been doing that for a while. It's just that now we can do it a little bit more precisely, I would say. So automate the reporting goes into the macro decisions. Uh, build dashboards for monitoring the performance of the business is typically also uh, part of the macro decisions that we can help with data. Um, what we call business intelligence, which is different from that, which is basically use the data to do things like, is this product uh, performing well? Um, or should I, uh, should, how do I segment my portfolio? That sort of thing. Now the micro decisions are much more interesting for our discussions because those are the ones that only the recent uh, technologies and the, um, the, 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 the low price of computing power that we have nowadays make possible and weren't possible before. So the first one I in red in the micro decision that I have first category here is to support the credit decision making. So support means inform credit decision making with things like credit scoring or rating the customer and things like that. So now we are micro because we touch the smallest level, the, the one contract or the one client that was not possible before, in particular when you have one million or uh, hundreds of thousands of clients. And the last one, which is I think the most advanced one we can look at here, is to automate the risk exposure. So basically to sometimes in some certain conditions make an, a decision automatic based on the data for should I expose myself to this client, for what amount should I expose or how much should I provision for this client. So basically the management of the risk now step by step, customer by customer, contract by contract becomes automated thanks with data and, and, and the small price of computing power. So that's the, the, the first uh, slide about uh, decision making. Now, the second question I want to, to touch here is the one from the poll. And I don't know if we have the result of the poll now complete, if we've closed the poll, Michael? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yes, we no, have the no. no. Okay. She has a poll, All the right. no has won, uh, basically. So please comment. 
Okay, cool. I'm happy because I like to disagree uh, with what being said, and here I can very much disagree. So we can move to the next slide. The poll says, no, we don't have. And the next slide from myself is that, yes, we have the right data. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, we could talk for hours about that and discuss um, whether I'm right or the poll is right and the general opinion is right. But I want to do this slide because I want to point something out. That's something I already mentioned before in one of the questions. What we want here is to, in financial services in particular, I said the answer is yes. Why? Because we have extremely high quality, uh, high uh, uh, data that have a high uh, predictive value. If you can clean them, and, and Denise and Avetis have been there to talk about, about that, preparing, and I'm just coming after when everything in the world, the job is very well executed by them, but when it's just, something that we can start using, then it's of high predictive value um, and we can make an intensive use of it. And what do I mean by that is this, um, this pyramid here, we should take it from the, from the top and say, okay, we could look at the contract and say, oh, all I know is who paid well and who didn't pay well. So that's a yes or no, a Boolean, very, very limited in terms of data. But if we take the same situation, we could also look at the maximum number of days in areas on that contract. So that's already, uh, here an example is 15, that's already much preciser than a yes, it's a 15 now. We could also do the same number of days in areas, but for each and single installment. So if you have monthly loans every single month now, you have a 15, you have a seven, you have a two, you have an 18, so it's even much more data already. Then we could also, and that's an important step forward, look at the weighted delays. Someone who's late, two persons are late of 10 days on their installment. One is late for only 10% of his installment and one is late for the full installment for 10 days. This is very, very different in terms of the business. Do we recognize it in data? Usually no. And I'm arguing here that making intensive use of data is that you actually know this. It's just a question of looking at it. You could also do the same thing for the advances. Has this person prepared some money? The whole money, some money before the installment? Is he coming two days before the installment to prepare the money? Even maybe he's paying small amounts every day. That's something that usually we don't look at. And that's also having a lot of predictive value. Um, and ultimately even that doubles the whole value of that, or if not triples, is the variability. You look at all this data, Yes, but you also look at how they evolve over time, whether I'm a steady person doing always the same thing and you know what to expect from me, or whether I'm a very volatile people and change all the time. So I argue that if you don't try to use, um, uh, make an extensive use of junk data that you don't really care of, but you do a careful, intensive use of the key essential data, I'm arguing that yes, we have uh, enough data and that's what I call high uh, resolution banking data. Um, so if I still have some time, I want to show you um, what this is in reality. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, this is an example, I call, it, I call it a case study, where you see indeed the installments of a, of a client. You see here um, seven installments of a client and you can look just at the status and say okay this is a future installment this one has been paid on time or paid late this is a yes or no that we saw but now you can also look at the, the column the past due days so how many days has his past uh, he's been in past due and see now you see a difference between the sixth and the fifth installment both were late but one was late for two days and one for 14. then you have the the wad uh, which is something rubik's produces which is the weighted average, uh, the weighted advances or delays. So you see that, yes, it was 14 for installment number six, it was 14, but if you weight that by how much was actually late in terms of the installment, you see it's a 2.78 and not a 14. Now you start to understand much better what is going on with this client. And the two um, um, paid on time, you see that one was paid with 18.91 days weighted days in advance and the other one for 1691. So a lot of time in advance, not just paid on time. Paid on time is very restrictive in this case. And then the, the last uh, two columns are just showing you what the kind of things that can be done with that. So I, they are being covered by the picture for me, but um, in here you see the 
prediction for the future installment and you say, okay, I, we predict that probably the next installment will be paid between 10.59 days in advance uh, weighted or what and to 1.67 uh, delay. So now you start looking at your future installment and say, okay, I'm predicting now how they are likely to be paid. In this case, the variability of this customer, as you can see in the past was large. So the confidence interval is also large. You don't know exactly when it will be paid, but you know, uh, you have some insights about his future payment. So very briefly on the last slide for today, um, I have here the a few comments on, and I will not cover the full slide, but I will have a few comments on what data analysis approach can be used. In the next slide, I have mentioned three here. I will leave it for you to read um, carefully later. The scorecards, the computational intelligence, and the last, the Bayesian decision theory. This, oops, yeah, the scorecard, we, we know, we all know, I think the scorecard, it's, um, you keep the control in the scorecard. It's the expert opinion that is just configured in rules in a tool. You give, you say, I think it's uh, worth 10 points if you have a, a car that is uh, newer than three years. I think if you have uh, three sal salaried people, then it, it's five points, that sort of things. It's good, you keep control, but usually, and I can discuss this in much longer time, it's provides quite poor results and it's really not up to what can be done now. The computational intelligence, that's when you don't care so much about what the data is really and you let a computer calculate for you the correlation between the data. That's a bit in the category of what I call, uh, for financial services in particular, of what I call extensive use of data and not intensive use of data. And the third one, but, but sorry, on the computational intelligence, you always have good results, but you are losing control and you have the black box effect. Now in the Bayesian decision theory approach, what you do is you use economics uh, to model what is happening um, and what you're trying to model. You're basically trying to optimize the decision with an econ economic modeling of the relationship between you, the bank, and the client, and the credit officer, for instance. And then you use data to go and optimize that model. Um, and that gives you still control over what is happening. You're not losing the control. It's not the black box effect. But you're still using the power of data, unlike the scorecards. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Denise. That uh, was uh, uh, a great. Uh, peace uh, again and uh, also uh, we all see it's heavy cost the 60 minutes are not enough to discover everything and to discuss everything that was mentioned the preparation we have just two minutes left now uh, so I don't know if there are any questions uh, we probably cannot really do a lot but what I would like to do is um, uh, just to ask a quick comment from Avitis and Denise uh, each for 30 seconds only if anything to add to what uh, Denise uh, Moniot just said before we wrap it up and close the call on time uh, Dennis actually closed the, the topic, actually. So we started from collecting data, making it uh, clear, and then getting the, uh, making the data speak. So he has closed everything the, in terms of the, from the beginning of the project to the end of the project. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, Avitis, Denise. I just uh, just can say that uh, we uh, in our business we go the same way uh, with Denise. So we use computation, computational intelligence and uh, economics uh, KPIs and uh, economic metrics uh, to uh, to train our models, and this is very powerful. Okay, great. I I think um, uh, with that, looking at the time, I think we have to wrap it up. So. Um, uh, I would like to give a very big hand uh, to our three panelists today. So, uh, uh, in Thank representation you. of the of the whole uh, audience we had today from about thirty countries for making the time to prepare for this session, uh, for spending your time to deliver the session um, uh, at your own time expense. Thank you very much for that. It was great to have you here, and um, we will post to our audience uh, again the. Uh, edited podcast of this session on uh, our website uh, in a few days, answer any questions which we have not been able to answer. And uh, with this, uh, I also would like to wrap up the session in total. So if we can have the last slide now, uh, looking at this, uh, so 
Uh, the summer is over. This was a summer series of uh, digitizing MSME finance of BFC. Uh, keep calm and go digital. I, I'm sure we can say we have managed to be keep calm and go digital. Basically, keep calm, yes. Go digital is work in progress. Summer is over now. This series is over, but the digitization is not over. Will not be over soon. And uh, so uh, I hope we, and I'm sure we stay in touch with our audience. And um, I'd like to thank once more all the speakers we had in all the sessions here. It was a great experience for us uh, to create this platform. And we will now digest everything and the good feedback we got and see how we continue. But first of all, we take a small break on this. And uh, if you have any questions, the audience, uh, please connect with us. Uh, it was great to have you all here. Uh, so, did I miss anything? I guess not. And we have 11.01, so we are always on time. Swiss punctuality. Thank you very much for being with us, dear speakers, today. Uh, again, have a great rest of the week to all of you, and we are in touch uh, at some point soon, uh, the one or the other way. Thank you very much, and bye bye for now. Good luck Thank with the digitization. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.